Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kathy Sabo, and I'm the Executive Director at Toronto Western Hospital. And I'm very pleased to welcome you here this afternoon on behalf of our hospitals and the Foundation to the second behind the scenes lecture for 2008. And this is actually our first uh, behind the scenes lecture in the Mars uh, Auditorium, and so we hope that you enjoy uh, our venue this afternoon. The behind the scenes lectures were developed to provide you, our donors, with a first hand view of how our scientists and clinicians work to develop the best therapeutics for patients. It's our way of saying thank you for your generous support of our hospitals. I'm delighted to see that so many of our donors take an, are taking an active interest in the work we do by attending these lectures. And at the end of the lecture, we invite you to share your comments by filling out the survey that's included in the materials that have been left on your seats or that you've been handed out today. And there's so much to share with you about the groundbreaking research in the various programs that transform patient care. Today's presentation showcases the innovative breakthroughs and treatment options for movement disorders, specifically Parkinson's disease, developed at the University Health Network in collaboration with the University of Toronto. Today, our guest speaker is Dr. Anthony Lang, and Dr. Lang is the director of the Morton and Gloria Schulman Movement Disorders Centers at the Toronto Western Hospital. So I'd now like to invite Linda Bryson, who's the director of major and planned gifts at Toronto Western Hospital, to introduce Dr. Lang. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you all for coming today. Um, it's a great honor for me to introduce Dr. Tony Lang, the director of the uh, Morton and Gloria Schulman's Movement Disorders Center. Now, he's not only the director, he also created the center. Um, today, it's the largest movement disorders clinic in Canada and one of the most reputable programs in the world. They treat, the, they, they treat patients, they assess pace, patients, and they conduct all kinds of research there. Dr. Lang has recruited the best, most reputable neurologists and neurosurgeons to, to accompany him on his team. And he is a founding member of the executive committee members of the Parkinson's Study Group, a nonprofit, a nonprofit cooperative group of the Parkinson's disease experts for medical centers in the United States and in Canada. They're dedicated for improving the treatment for people affected by Parkinson's disease. Dr. Lang is also a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology and a professor and director of the Division of Neurology at the University of Toronto. He's also the current chairholder of the Jack Clark Chair for Parkinson's Disease Research at the University of Toronto. And he was the recipient of the 2005 Research Award for the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Tony Lang. Well, thank you, Linda, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me get my presentation straight. So, I thought what I'd do is try to give you a bit of a soup to nuts view of Parkinson's disease, introducing our clinic first, but really moving on to Parkinson's disease research, emphasizing some of the things that our group has done and where I think that uh, Parkinson's research needs to go over the next little while. Just to introduce you to who we are and why we're, or how we're doing what we're doing, um, we do have a very large clinic. We're now seven full-time movement disorders uh, staff. Uh, we are involved in research, education, patient care. I see some patients here in the audience that we try to help. And we're very much involved in trying to move research from the bench to the bedside and back again. We're involved in a variety of different things, as you can see on this slide, with clinical care being uh, preeminent. But research has to be part of this. I don't think that I'd be just taking care of patients. Uh, I really feel that we need to see uh, advances coming along and see changes in the way we manage. And so our research uh, takes many forms, including clinical work on just looking at symptoms and complications of drugs, 
We are very much involved in genetics, as I'll tell you about this afternoon, and what I'll tell you about what epidemiology is. We're very much involved in drug trials of a variety of sorts. I'll tell you a little bit about that. And one of our uh, primary roles is in the education and the field of movement disorders and uh, taking people from all over the world that want to train in this field, uh, educating them, and often sending them back uh, to their countries to uh, bring the knowledge that we've given them to, um, to their populations. This is a slide that just simply outlines some of the many things that we're involved in. And I won't go through it in any detail, but you can see the subspecialty components of a movement disorders program that makes it very important. And of course, uh, you'll hear a little bit about surgery as I'm uh, talking. So let's just deal with the main problem that I'm going to address this afternoon, and that's Parkinson's disease. And when I was a student, we often used this acronym, tremor, rigidity, akinesia, and postural disturbances, or TRAP, to define the characteristic features. But we now recognize Parkinson's disease is much more than just TRAP. It's uh, many sources of disability that uh, can be in part subserved by these features, but we now recognize that it's a much broader disorder and one that we really have to attend to in, in many, many respects. You're probably aware of the name dopamine. Dopamine is a transmitter in the brain. It's used by cells in this area of the brain called the substantia nigra pars compacta. And it's substantia nigra, the black substance, because the cells that manufacture and utilize dopamine are pigmented. They have melanin, it's a slightly different melanin than we have in our skin that when, when we tan, for example. And this neural melanin is a byproduct of the metabolism of this transmitter dopamine. And Parkinson's disease is in part, and I'll emphasize in only part, due to a disturbance of these dopamine cells. And with the loss of these dopamine cells, we see a reduction in the dopamine system that projects from the black substance, and you see the loss of the black substance in a patient's brain with Parkinson's disease, a loss of this dopamine projection to areas of the brain that are very important to movement, but also to behavior, and I'll talk about the variety of different symptoms as we go. We're also going to come back to this term a little later on, the Lewy body, which is a little inclusion that one sees under the microscope, and we'll talk about why that's so important over the course of uh, the discussion. So when we talk about treatment of Parkinson's disease, we can divide the treatment into these three general categories. S uh, treatment that improves symptoms. The analogy I always use with patients is that it's like um, having a sore throat. If you've got a bacterial sore throat, a strep throat, um, we have extremely good lozenges. So if you have an excellent lozenge for a strep throat, you may not even be aware that you've got something wrong with your throat. Unfortunately, a lozenge isn't going to kill the bacteria. It's not going to cure the disease, but it very effectively manages the symptoms. And so we have quite effective symptomatic therapy that can block or uh, address the symptoms quite effectively for a long period of time. Ideally, what we would like to do is restore the brain improve the numbers of cells that manufacture and use dopamine and do the variety of other things that uh, cells lost are involved in. And then the third uh, major subcomponent of treatment can be considered protective, a treatment that would slow the progression of the disease because Parkinson's disease along with Alzheimer's disease and ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease and a variety of others are what we call neurodegenerations. These are degenerative diseases of the brain that slowly get worse with time. And we'd like to understand the cause of the degenerative process and reverse it if possible and block it and prevent it from getting, uh, progressing and getting worse. And so in an ideal world, we'll have protective therapies. So these are the three ways one can divide treatment, and I'm going to address each of them over the course of the afternoon.